uh, and always, always, always interesting and fascinating conversation uh, about wellness. Welcome, Dr. Wong. How are you today? I am great. Thank you for having me. I love being here. I'm glad to hear that people are enjoying it. Yeah, you, me too. <laughs> me too. There's nothing, there's nothing worse than saying, oh, this segment's going to be great. It's going to be fantastic. People are going to love it. And then... Nobody. I know because you know I always was worried about because my dad said he hated going to doctors so I thought who's gonna want to listen to a doctor in a radio show right, right. but so I didn't want to be the bad news doctor <laughs> <laughs> but I'll, I'll tell you right now uh, the best thing about what we do here and what you provide is just straight down the middle information and I'm talking medicine I'm talking this is what your health should be I love that and I think that anyone listening feels the same way so thank you again Thank you. All right. uh, you sent me a, a, a kind of a, a Halloween health anthem oh, as well. I to bring that. Oh, that's okay. I've got it right here. Uh, I, are we going to cut it to music? Do you want to cut it to music or anything later? Sure. All right. Sure. We'll do that later. Yeah. So. Oh, I thought I was going to bring it. I forgot. I'm glad I sent it to you because I knew I'd forget. Yeah. So it starts. I'll just give, I'll just do the very first verse if I can. On a night when the moon is high, the witches brew and the spirits fly. A secret potion waits to tell how genes hold the key to health so well. That's a great first verse. What a great opening that is. Genes are really, are they, do they hold the secret to our health? 100%. I mean, I, I, you know, the, the old adage was, you know, oh, if your parents had it, you're going to get it. Right. You know, you're just destined to have it. But now we know with epigenetics, that's not true. We know that 25% of your uh, of your um, genes make up the, your health matrix, right? 25%. The rest is 75% what you do with that. Right? So you can flip it on, you can flip it off. You know, I always use the, the, um, the um, example of the two female um, identical twins where they did the studies. Um, another uh, just went to a conference and they used the, I guess it's the Macmillan twins. And so these were male. So I'm glad to have now male twins to use. So they're identical genes, right? And, but we, the way they were nurtured and the way they had their lifestyle, one became, you know, a father, had kids, um, worked, made money. The other one became a, a, fake, a, a robber, right? He uh, okay. was in jail. He went the other direction. Right. Same, exact same of genes, but the influence of their lifestyles made a different outcome. So we have that influence. So it may, those genes are there from your parents, but you can influence it. So knowing your genetic makeup is key. 75% environmental then. Yep. 25% genetic all the Correct. way across. Correct. When I hear people talking about genetic engineering, can we actually, if you have a, uh, uh, a long history of, let's say, cancer in your family or some kind of disease in your family, can we eventually engineer that out genetically, specifically for that family or that line? I'm going to answer that in two different ways, right? Yes to what you're saying, because they are doing that. So if somebody says, I've got gout, and I don't want to have the gout, and then we're going to identify the gene and try to take that out. So they were working on that sort of thing. I'm not sure that that's something that we really want to do ethically. Where are we going to do alternating the genes? They do it, and they're trying to do this in animals and, you know, the, the studies. But where I'm saying where you can alter it is epigenetics. You have control. So you have absolute control. So. Um, if your family is riddled with cancer, right, just everyone gets it, well, there's a reason for that. And there, so you are genetically a setup for it, right? So now you're going to want to have a different lifestyle. So what is it that flipped that gene on to get that cancer? Is it because you don't sleep? Is it because you don't do the four pillars, right? You don't eat the right foods. You don't move. You um, don't find the, the aha moments. Uh, you don't do the sleep and repair, right? So, and you do all of these other things. And then you live by a toxic waste. You, you know, you live in toxic soup area, right? Right, right? So all of those things can flip your genes up. So yes, you can then alter your that genetic makeup to eliminate it and not get it. And it's fascinating. Thank you. And when you mentioned gout, I was just thinking, well, I'll just eat less pastrami. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we are living in an era of 
personalized lifestyle medicine. Uh, describe to us what that is, please. Okay. So, um, well, I'm just say, you know, I went to the conference that was on that. So basically, um, everyone has a unique blueprint. So if you have a thyroid problem and somebody else has a thyroid problem and they come in and they go say, what's your program that you treat thyroid? I'm like, I don't have a program. It's what's your genetic makeup? What's your unique makeup? What do you need? Right? It's to the individual. It is specific to the individual. It's specific to you. Right? And, you know, inflammation can be created by multiple different things. And what, what we're really finding out is that, because I've been working on this, is immune resilience, right? So immune, immune resilience, if you don't have that, and then you have um, this metabolic distortion, dysregulation, which people talk about as diabetes or insulin resistant, that's all because the immune system kind of went haywire or underwire or didn't do what it needs to do to keep the body regulated. And a lot of that's coming from the gut mi microbiome. People are talking about the gut, that's the immune system. And then the gut's related to the brain. Then you get the neural inflammation. So all of these things are interrelated and it's about your lifestyle. So let's just say that you eat all processed food from cardboard boxes and there's no nutrition in there. And then you gain a bunch of weight. Now you're extremely heavy and you're just sitting on the couch and you're not doing anything. How well is that mitochondria working to help you repair and the immune system help you to heal and keep you safe? And the brain now is worried about like, I can't get all this work done and now you feel depressed and you feel anxious and you're just sit more on the couch. It's just a vicious cycle. So it's all related, but, it's, but we can figure out what's going on for you and just making a few changes. It's as easy, and I, I know it sounds easy when I say it's as easy as really just going by the four pillars that you constantly tell us about. Uh, and if we el immediately eliminate two of those pillars from our lives, uh, we're, we're, we're going backwards, that point, right? Yep. Okay. Oh my God, that's, that, I love this. So uh, talk to us about the, the bi-directional relationship between metabolism and the immune system. Okay. So... Uh, the immune, um, well, as a, you know, we used to think that the immune system is just a one area, but, but it turns out every cell, every organ is contributing to um, your immune system. Right? And so if you have um, this dysregulation and metabolism in a certain area, um, your immune system's going to be off. Right? So, and then you're going to have um, so whatever disease state that you have. So let's just take something like um, neuroinflammation, right? So you have um, high sugars, and instead of um, utilizing the sugar and having enough and getting it into the cells, and you have you now go into this glycation, which is the sugar attaching to the protein and the fat, which now gets sticky, makes your blood sticky and clogs things up. And let's say that your genes were has this little where your Achilles heel is in the neural inflammation area. So now you have this ability or creation of this inflammation that's created in your brain, right? And so now you're having Parkinson's, dementia, Alzheimer's, but you could have controlled it by not having this dysregulation of your metabolism which the immune system are, is in the microglial cells of the brain, which is what controls that, those microglial cells, and now they're dis, dysregulated and they're not functioning as well and they're going haywire and you, get, you start putting things down like amyloid plaques, which is in Parkinson's, right? But they've done, I'm gonna kind of go off on a side No, 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 I love but, this, this is perfect. But right. the amyloid um, cells, so they, they think that that created Parkinson's because they find in the brains of Parkinson's all this amyloid cells. But then they find that all these healthy people who didn't have Parkinson's has all these amyloid cells. So what's up, right? So what it is is that the microglial and all of the immune system in the brain cells is trying to protect it. So now you're diabetic and you have all this sugar and you eat all this stuff, the protein and the fats, they kind of clog things up. That's where your Achilles heel is. And the immune cells there are saying like, oh, we got to protect it. So they put down these um, 
what were uh, cells the uh, amyloid oil cells right. put those cells down but is more protective to prevent it but then all of a sudden one person who has that that um, glitch to make the Parkinson's they couldn't control it enough and then you get the Parkinson so that so it's not actually the amyloid cells it's this immune dysregulation the metabolism in that area so wherever your genetic Achilles heel is and then you get that immune dysregulation. So some people get autoimmune, some people get, you know, whatever it is. Parkinson's is insidious and beautifully described, by the way. Thank you for that. So uh, can I, I'm going to take you back. I'm going to take a right turn here and, and take you back to my 11th grade physiology class, if I can. If I'm, and, and correct me if I'm crazy here. But leukocytes uh, in our body, they, they attack disease cells, or they attack the disease too many leukocytes uh, and we get leukemia. Where does that, where does that, where's that line crossed, if I agree? So, so macrophages, those are big defenses. And so that's the immune defense, right? And this is your uh, metabolism dysregulation. So when you call up the macrophages, let's just say you get a cut on your leg, okay? And now, it's getting irritated. So the macrophages go there, they kind of gobble up the bacteria, they try to keep it clean and keep it off. Now, if it gets dysregulated and you have like some disorder on your skin or something that's not going on, so they use called macrophages, they're, they're called M1, so the first stage of them. And then they go um, transfer over, or maybe it's the M2. So the M2, the M2 are the healthy ones. Okay, and so now you've got the M2s and then all of a sudden, something goes haywire and you get more M1. Then it becomes a disease state, right? We don't want that. So we need that balance between the macrophages when, um, and I, you know, I'd have to review all the technology of this, but, um, the, but you know, basically, you know, you've got your bouncers and you've got all the, the helpers and you've got the policemen and they're all kind of managing all of this. But one, one just kind of goes awry and they just take off. And that's the macrophage. And then it's just through, throughout the body and all the cells of everything. So in leukemia, you're saying the neutrophils, those became wild and then they became abundant and became leukemia, right? But it can be in any cells, in any organ, in any place of the body. And it's really starting from the macrophages, which is your immune system and it's part of the dysregulation. So when, when someone is looking to, uh, to a professional, wellness this is where you go I'm, this is where I go and I can, I'm, I'm delighted at how clearly you can explain this to us uh, one of the questions that I uh, I had gotten from a listener I didn't include it on, on, on the sheet was about psoriasis and diet and is there a way to control uh, psoriasis through the diet yeah so psoriasis is not autoimmune right so that is that is where your dysregulation is in um, so you have an autoimmune, which means that your uh, immune system in that area has gone haywire. It's gone a little bit overabundant, and now it's attacking itself. And the area that it's attacking is the skin. So if you do things that are inflammatory to that, it's going to create it, make it worse. So you can totally control it by doing things that are of the four pillars. Okay. Uh, always back to that because that's how very important those four pillars are. I mean, there are nuances um, to all of these things because if you're doing all the four pillars and it's not right, then we have to dig deeper and go a little bit more specific because there are what I talk about, and I'm, we're going to get into these, the five uh, key factors for inflammation, right? So, for, but let's just go back to the four pillars for this person. So they would just do food. They have to be anti-inflammatory foods. So you have to figure out and know what anti-inflammatory food diet is. It's pretty simple. It's with just whole foods, your produce, your proteins, vegetables, just nothing processed. Stay away from garbage. Right, nothing processed, no ultra processed, very clean food. So you need clean food. And then you definitely need movement because the more movement you have, the better your mitochondrions work, and the mitochondrion is where your immune cells, cells are functioning and working, and that is what's repairing and restoring things. So then if that's gonna be working, humming along, it's gonna kind of say, hey, let's let's put things in check here, right? And then 
the, the mood is the same thing. It's also also getting all things, uh, you know, in, in balance. And then the fourth one, which uh, you know, I don't think we've delved in too much, is about the the sleep or the repair. And so repairing the body. So if you have to be able to detox, so um, detoxing and repairing is through sleep. Um, it's through the foods that you eat. Uh, it's through the water and hydration that you do. It's through the exercise and the sweat that you do. It's through the deep breathing you do, the exhaling, all of that. So it's all combined in there. So when we talk about restorative sleep, uh, and you're right, we, we should talk about it more because not enough of us get restorative sleep. Some people sleep a few hours a night. Some people sleep maybe eight hours, but they toss and turn. They're not really getting restorative sleep. It's that deep uh, REM sleep, yes. if you will, right? That's yes. what we need in order to repair our bodies, in order for our bodies to heal from whatever garbage we did to it all day long. Yep. Do you get enough sleep? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I set, uh, you know, I set up for that one. Okay. Yeah, well, you know, I, uh, you know, you're supposed to, you know, what, what is it, walk the talk? Uh, <laughs> I don't do that one so well, but I do try to get my deep sleep. Um, so, I mean, you, you, you want to go to bed at a reasonable hour. You want to make sure your adrenals and the HPA axis is functioning well. And that really is going, you know, I mean, I mean, none of us do it because we have all the electronics and all this blue light and all this. But, um, you know, if you go in the sundown and then get up at the sunrise, uh, but hopefully you're not living in Alaska or, you know, Norway. You know, you're going to have a problem there. But, um, but so if you go to bed um, around 10 or so, which I don't ever do, I try to. And um, when I feel... But I listen to my body. When I know that I'm overworked or I feel like I've been attacked by a virus, I know that I need to sleep. I'll go to bed. I'll go to bed at eight, seven. I'll go and just sleep because I know I need that deep sleep. Um, and then um, I try to relax my brain, uh, let those thoughts go out, and just try to get down into that deep, deep delta uh, and sleep, right? Um, and I mean, not everybody needs to have a full night's sleep. So, I mean, the studies say eight hours, seven hours, whatever it is, but there are some people, they do the studies on them and they function well at four hours. The reflexes are good. And so those people, there are not many of those, but there are some people who are, um, that sleep only four hours. But I say that we generally sleep in four hour chunks. We don't really sleep straight through the night. You wake up, you're kind of vigilant because we're still looking out for that panther that's gonna attack us. And we gotta know that it's not there. But the problem with a lot of people is that when the liver's been working and detoxing and then all of a sudden there you go, is there a panther out there? They wake up at three in the morning and they're like, oh, I kind of felt something, but it was the liver like churning away, cleaning things out. But then your mind starts going, what about that project I need to do in the morning? And then they can't get back to sleep. You gotta train yourself to be able to just ignore those things. And I got a lot of worries and stress, but you know, I just try to turn it off. And it is just easy as that. You practice, you meditate and you practice that's at. Um, so when I do sleep, I get my deep sleep. I make sure that I, and if I have it, then I try to get it during the day sometime. <laughs> I can pay, do a quick uh, quick nap and get restored and um, it just feels just as good as eight hours. So a 20 minute cat nap is actually restorative. Sometimes. Yeah, it can be. I mean, there's been studies on it. I think there's been, it's in a, some people say yes, some and so, but if you can do it and you feel good, some people they sleep and then they just are groggy all day. Right, so it just depends. When I get my best sleep, I actually sometimes, and this may sound crazy, but uh, when I get my best sleep, during that sleep, I say to myself, oh, this is pretty good sleep. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> I, yeah, I don't know how that happens, but I'm saying to myself, well, this is pretty good sleep here. I well, the conscious it. mind and subconscious mind are always talking to each other. Okay, <laughs> so, uh, and, and I want to stay on sleep for just a second if I can. Uh, more likely to get really good sleep if you don't eat a meal before oh, and also exercise if you exercise before sleep is your heart pumping too much to get good sleep or is that a good thing yeah so there's sleep hygiene i think people don't do enough sleep hygiene so those are some of the key factors that you have mentioned so you def definitely don't want to be on a full stomach and you don't want your stomach working and doing all of that. So you're supposed to do it during the day, get, make your energy, and then they're gonna start cleaning things up. And so they don't want to have a, a lot of having to digest. So you don't want to eat late and right before bed. Um, you don't want to have a lot of uh, light 
uh, right before bed because you, you know, the, the brain is supposed to know that the sun is set, it's time to, the melatonin needs to go down, I need to now, now go to sleep. And, and that's so, millions of years of evolution that has trained us in thinking that, right? That, right? Absolutely. So the sun sets, your melatonin starts to rise, and then you start to get groggy and sleepy, and then you want to sleep. And then some people will go past it, and then they, they throw it down, and then they put their cortisols up, and then they're all screwed up, right? So you just want to be in tune to that. So um, uh, so that that's part of uh, the sleep hygiene and... What else did you say? Oh yeah, exercise. exercise so yeah. you don't want to be stimulating the body beforehand um, because um, that's more of a wakeful state. But um, you know, mild stretching, something to relax, that type of thing is okay. But you don't want a, a good old adrenaline pumping, endorphin rush where you're now wide awake and that type of thing. So no, you don't want to do it. It's relaxing. So people who read on Kindles, uh, that's not as great because there's a lot of light on that. Maybe wear blue light glasses to, to prevent the, the intake of those, um, those um, UV ray, those uh, wavelengths. Um, so those are some of the, the things. So I, that's one of the key factors that I, I look at when somebody says that they don't sleep well. We need to analyze and look at you know, what, you know, what they're doing before bed and then what are the hours that they're going to sleep. If you're going to sleep around two, that's like the worst time because that's not good. You need to get be, be, between, between 10 and midnight between that sometime to really for the brain to kick in and have that good circadian rhythm. You wanna be on that same circadian rhythm. Another good way to get, so especially with jet lag, I mean, what to do, you can do is just, when you get to the new country, just be barefoot on the, the earth that is there. So now you're getting down to that frequency wavelength of that area and get their circadian rhythm set. And so if you don't normally have a good circadian rhythm, one of the things to do is get up in the morning. Now, I don't I don't subscribe to doing this particularly, but somebody said, you know, get a bucket of water and then put your feet in there and stand and, let, and watch the sunrise. I just say, just stand on the grass outside and uh, lay on the grass, go, we got the beach, lay on the beach. See, and be up with the sunrise and get grounded and then set your circadian rhythm. And then when you're tired at night, which is probably gonna be about eight o'clock or so, right. nine o'clock, then get, go to bed, nine o'clock and just go to bed. But a lot of us just kick it on, I'm guilty of that, and keep on going past that moment. I, I feel, I, and you, you nailed it for me, I feel nine, 10 o'clock, I'm ready to go. I'm, I'm, I'm ready. And I make the mistake. I don't know that it's. I sleep pretty well. I think I sleep pretty well. Uh, but I, I make. I, I need to fall asleep to a little Seinfeld or some Law and Order. Or I, I fall asleep to the TV, and then I, I wake up a couple hours later. I shut it off, and then I'm. Uh, and the rest of my night is kind of cool. Uh, but when you mentioned that, uh, in some cases, people advocate for standing in a bucket of water. I, I don't understand. That. No, just grounding. Right? grounding okay. It's about it's about grounding, getting the frequencies, and grounding. And to the earth, um, I just think you can get grounding just by actually, you know, standing up on the sand and on uh, actually touching the earth. But, but some people, you know, I don't get, have that if they're in an apartment or whatever. I get some of my best sleep after a nice hot shower. I, I take a hot shower and then I just feel that's the relaxation. The relaxation. That we, right, that's what that is. Okay. Yeah, yeah, right. nine, nine, ten o'clock, that is what we're, our bodies are designed. But we typically, we're still going at that time. I mean, I don't know about, you know, Spain and all Europe when they're actually just having their dinner at that hour. 9.30, 10 o'clock at night, right. They're having their dinner, but they have a whole different thing because they take a siesta in the afternoon and they are sleeping. I mean, you go there and you can't find a shop that's open in the afternoon, right? They're all sleeping, right? right? They so were they're up eating dinner at 10 o'clock. <laughs> right, yeah. so, so different. So they're doing it a little different way, but... I grew up in a household where we ate fairly late, and to this day, I, we still eat late at my house. And uh, I'm later than normal. I'm not Spain late, but I eat fairly, fairly late. Uh, so, are you ready to answer some questions from sure. listeners? Okay. Uh, this listener wants to know the health benefits of the following three, uh, not all together, but individually. Uh, the health benefits of ginger, health benefits of garlic, and the health benefits of pomegranate. So ginger, um, I use, I take that every day. 
I use that more for the anti-inflammatory, but you know, it's, it's good with nausea. So you hear it with pregnancy, people use it with nausea. Um, digestion, sometimes they say with ulcers. Um, you know, just a, um, joint pains, muscle pains, because it's anti-inflammatory. Um, it's also good for, I think, for fungal, so antimicrobial type of thing. So there's a whole host of things that I think ginger is just really fabulous for cardiovascular uh, cholesterol. Uh, benefits on there. Um, I think there's maybe also a little bit of cognition um, about that too. Um, and I think all all of these are going to have crossover for some of those things too because um, they have polyphenols. So polyphenols is what we need, right? So it's the color. So I mean, garlic and ginger don't have that brilliant color, but they have a lot of good benefits. I mean, um, and I use garlic every day. I like to. Use, I take uh, aged garlic um, with, for with immune and cardiovascular. It's a. Uh, um, if if you want to know, I can get send you the link if you go to my website and connect with me, and um, I will get you it. But it's a uh, Wakan uh, Wak Wakanuga. Um, brand Colic um, Aged Garlic is the one that I use personally that I take daily. Um, and garlic is good for, um, as I said, cardiovascular, blood pressure. Um, so uh, I, I'll cook. I use garlic for everything. Yeah. You know, everything I cook, there's garlic. Yeah. You know, garlic I, make, I make a chimichurri that'll set you on fire. <laughs> yeah. it, it's a wonderful herb. Uh, cooking and tasting and health wise, it uh, has so many benefits. Pomegranate, um, I like to say it's a little bit of an aphrodisiac because it's a, one of the things that I uh, tell people to eat for um, good nitric oxide. And nitric oxide gives you good circulation. You have good circulation. You have a good erection. So everybody likes that. But um, so it's good. It lowers your blood pressure. Good for cognition for pomegranates. Um, so it's good cardiovascular. So that's a real, really good. But, but the key thing is, is polyphenol. So that's in your fruits and vegetables, your root vegetables, all of those. So you can't get enough polyphenols, um, actually. So Himalayan um, uh, buckwheat uh, is really has high density. And, and so I, I've been trying to cook with that, drink tea and that, sprout that. So that's, but those are polyphenols. So, but the, and and pomegranate also has uh, uh, what, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, Anti antioxidant. It's an antioxidant. It's what polyphenols is what the antioxidant. Okay. So it's that component that's in there. This one's kind of this one's kind of a strange question, but and I I know the answer to that. It it scares me to even think about it. Should you ever pull a scab off of a cut? I'm oh, thinking, I want to no. hear your answer before I I'm tell saying, my. I'm saying no. <laughs> I'm saying just let it fall off on its own, or you know whatever. Let it let, let, let it just dissipate because a scab. And I was taught in 11th grade physiology that it's our natural band aid. Yep, yep. Right. Well, so now we try to not get our natural band aid. How so? So, you know, they have all these silicon and they have these products. I use just uh, topical antibiotics or just moisturizers or things because if it slowly heals and granulates in, then you don't get that big, clumpy, dry, dry that, that, that part of it. And so you, I try to avoid getting that so that you don't get that itchy and that wanting to pick it off and peel it off and that type of thing because it, you can scar yourself with it. So, then, so with burn patients, I mean, if you just think about that, that's what happened with burn patients. They, if, especially around the thorax, if you have a circumferential and you let it scar down, you, that, that's called an eschar, and we have to cut that open so they can breathe and move their chest, right? So a lot of the treatments they're doing is maybe trying not to get that scarring down because you don't want it to scar down and, and constrict. So you want to do things that are, you know, moisturizing, that keep the antibacterial, that keep it and let it heal and that ep ep epithelialize and you'll get your strat you'll get your um, skin back, but not have the big thick layer of a scab. So we try not to even scab now. So not as crazy a question as I thought it was <laughs> to begin with. Thank you, thank you for answering that. Uh, this comes from a 60-year-old male uh, about to get labs. 
What kind of labs does a typical 60-year-old male need? What do you look for if they walk into your office? What kind of labs would you say, okay, this is what I want to see? So you said to walk into my office. So I'm going to go in my direction. But if I think if he's going for conventional, he's asking, looking for a little different answer. But if my budget was no option, then what I'm looking for is to do specialty labs. So one would be genetic testing, just to know your basic blueprint and what uh, you're made up of. Then I would want to know your mitochondrial function, um, how well is that functioning. And in that, there's a whole host of things like your toxic load and um, just knowing how well you're clearing things and heavy metals. And then I'd also would want to know your gut function, how good is and uh, healthy is your microbiome. So that would be the basics of that. And then on top of that, and then 60 year old, I probably would also want to know your hormone level, how you are clearing that to know if you are actually clearing and um, developing um, risk for prostate cancer. So I probably would want to know the hormones and then it would give me an idea of some cortisol levels, your melatonin and just your testosterone levels and things like that, so just one more. So those would be the four specialty labs that I would just do as a general basis just to get knowledge. And then on your routine labs, I have a whole host that I do. So your CBC, which is your white pounds and cells, you know, looking at your neutrophils and things like that we talked about, your platelets and things like that. A comp panel, which tells you your, you know, your, um, which is the sodium level, your electrolyte level, and then it has, um, the liver uh, portion of the liver panel in there. Um, I can't remember what else, but it's a, one of the panels on there. It'll tell you your glucose levels, um, what your, and you want it to be fasting. And then it would be um, the A1C. So I always like to know what people's A1C levels are. Um, I kind of want to know what your CRP is, which is um, your, for how much inflammation is going on. Then I want to know your homocysteine, because that's another inflammation marker, more pointed towards the cardiovascular. Um, and it also will tell me about your methylation, which is your detoxification system. And then I would want, um, I like, and at Quest and LabCorp has it too, I don't know what they call it at LabCorp, but at Quest, they have, it's called Cardio IQ, and I like it with the infl inflammation marker and the myo. Last and I don't remember what it's called specifically, but those markers will tell us not just your cholesterol level, the you know all the numbers that they normally tell you, but it'll tell you your particle sizes, which is more important than your numbers. Yeah, by particle sizes, what do you mean? So the particle sizes of the cholesterol. So they have the small clotting kind, so that's bad. So if you have a lot of those, that's dangerous. But if you have the big fluffy ones and you have the larger particle signs, that's okay. So let's say your LDL is not a good number, but they're all fluffy and big. Well, then I'm not worried. If you got bad, bad numbers and you have all little clotting ones, I'd be like, oh my God, we need to do something ASAP, right? So it's kind of what are those numbers made of? So you wanna know. So what particle size? And then I wanna know your lipo A, uh, li lipoprotein A, which is a genetic marker. So, and if that's high, then I'd say you were given a raw deal because genetically, diet and exercise won't change your numbers and maybe a statin would be good for you. Now, if your lipo A, uh, lipoprotein A is good, and your numbers are all bad and you got smart particles, I'd say you gotta get on the stick because you're not doing the four pillars, not at all. And it shows it right here. So you gotta do some changes and you can do it. If you wanna take a pill and just do the easy quick fix, fine, but there's a lot of consequences with those pills. So I would avoid that. Um, and then uh, I would wanna know your thyroid. So more than just the TSH is what they typically do. I would wanna know the free T3, free, uh, free T4. I would want to know the reverse T3, which they typically don't do. And then I would want to know all the antibodies to the thyroid because a lot of people have some antibodies going on in there that people don't realize. So I would want to know that. 
And then well, that's a lot of blood they're drawing. Then, oh <laughs> yeah, my my uh, family is not happy when they get their blood drawn at all. They're like, do we have and, to do this? And I think that brings up the question: Can 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 those things be found only through blood, or is the, the urine sample that we give? So, uh, the when I test the mitochondrion, that is also through urine. Okay. So it's a combination of blood and urine. Okay. Because uh, uh, you're looking at metabolites. Um, do you want me to go through the rest of the list yeah, that I said? Yeah, please, okay. please. And then, so that's the thyroid, and then um, so those are the thyroid, and then we did the liver, and we did the and then um, and typically I like to know the sex binding globulin. That's a hormone, um, uh, so that one has to be by blood. So that one would tell me um, whether or not that is chewing up your testosterone levels. Um, I think, oh, and uric acid, and then if, they're, if the comp panel doesn't show the albumin, I would want the albumin, right? And then for men, PSA. So I think that pretty much covers a lot of the systems. See, and again, if you need to, if, if this 60-year-old guy that uh, texted in, if you need to get those done, walk into her office and you'll get the full <laughs> battery of those labs. And is that... Uh, one vial of blood? Is that no. Blood? That's a lot of blood. That's a lot of blood. So you want to be hydrated for sure. All right. <laughs> uh, what are the and uh, this I'm not sure who, uh, male or woman, but what are the effects of a shingles vaccine? Um, so do they need us me that when you inject it, like you get a sore arm because right, yeah. you're puncturing of a muscle and then it's red and it's sore and my guess irritated. Is so, yeah, my guess is someone that's a little nervous about getting it. Yeah, so, yeah, so, yeah, it's just going to, sometimes you can get an upset stomach, a little nausea. I don't know if you get a little headache. So, so it's just basically your symptoms of what you would get from a virus, right? So that type of thing. But, I mean, um, what the shingles... Um, I mean, shingles is basically coming from when you you had chicken pox, right? So you had chicken pox. So I haven't researched this like recently, so I don't know if the if they, if, you know, if that uh, etiology has changed. But you would have had to have been exposed to chicken pox. Then you got chicken pox, and then that herpes virus stays in your body, dormant, and then it sits in one of the the nerve dermatomes in that that area. And then something happens, a stressor, physical, emotional, whatever, something happens and your immune system goes off and then that virus becomes active and you get shingles, right? So when you get shingles, it's pretty painful, devastating, and then there's sequelae to that, nerve damage, irritations, neuropathies, and so the sequelae of the shingles is what's really why this vaccine is happening. Um, because especially if you have it on the face and then you've got you know some neuropathies or pain on on, on, on that uh, or just just tender pain it's just you know people with neuropathy understand having numbness and tingling and pain all the time is not fun right so that's what they're preventing and it's an adjunct uh, vaccine meaning that they put something in there to stimulate your immune system with the inactive virus to for your body to then make uh, um, you know, antibodies against it. So it's a, uh, I think this is a, the adjunct is a, 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 gly, a glycoprotein IgE uh, that they combined it with the virus and then they inject it to you and then you develop, you know, your protection uh, against having the shingles. But, you know, I'm holistic. I just say, you know, keep your host healthy, right? Keep your immune system strong and healthy. But, there are people with comorbidities, age-wise, when you are aging, that's why they say at 65 and older, they you want to start to want to have these because your immune system is not robust. And if you are not working on your immune system, I would take all the help you can get. Thank you. Uh, lastly, from a 35-year-old female, is there a prevention or how do you prevent yeast infection? Can you prevent Yeah, well, you gotta look at the root cause. Right. What's what is going on? I mean, is it a hygiene issue? Then you need to just clean better. Right. A lot of people. I don't know if this is too graphic, but a no, lot. Go ahead. <laughs> I think I think one thing is that people don't do digital cleaning in there because they're afraid to touch themselves. But you should go in there and clean. Right. So That's clean right. that out. Uh, you don't necessarily have to use a douche, you know, but actually clean that out. So if you're 
had used tampons and something's in there. It's just not clean. So you need to know, is it well clean? So hygiene's one. Is it a diet thing? Are you eating too much sugar, uh, have an imbalanced diet? Now you have candida. And so you're growing, having bacterial, I mean, having, um, having yeast in there, um, if that's the cause. Or if you're having symptoms of yeast, but it's actually uh, bacteroides, uh, uh, phroeges, which is a bacterial infection, and that just because things were off and then you have a bacterial infection, so that needs to be treated with antibiotics, possibly, or um, we have dry herbs, but, um, uh, so, so if it's less, so let's just, so if you're a diabetic and you have too much sugar, so let's just go with that the cause is going to be diet related, okay? So if it's a diet related yeast, or let's just say you took antibiotics and then antibiotics will cause a yeast infection. So then you need to rebalance the pH and um, all the bacteria that's that's there, right? So then you need, you need to do certain things to prevent that. But let's just take the root cause of diet, which I think is more common. Um, so to get rid of that, you have to clear the diet of all the sugars. So that would be no fruit, no fermented foods, um, and do that for, I don't know, several, a week to ten, two weeks. You're gonna feel faint, weak, and dizzy, and you're gonna feel fatigued, and you're gonna have this, um, this, uh, this, uh, uh, micro, uh, I can, this, whatever, this, uh, I'm thinking, I can't think of the word right now, but this, the, the dead stuff that comes off the, that, the sludge, okay. right? Um, there's a specific word, but I'm blanking on it. I like, I like your description. I'm thinking, you know, forget the specific word. That description just nailed it for me. I know what you mean. So the die off of all <laughs> that extra yeast right. is the sludge that right. you have to clear, so you're going to feel not so great. Um, so when you do that, then you can get yourself back in balance so that when you do have that cake or cookie or so, you don't get more yeast. Right? So those people who tend to have yeast and then they're saying, oh, I'm taking a probiotic or I'm taking that yogurt, but it may be it's because their diet is off and everything is already off and we need to get it in balance. And then you can just you know enjoy your cake every now and then, right? So. Beautifully described and thank you so very much. Uh, as I look at our clock and I'm looking at the uh, text connect, our listeners are wondering if they need to get in touch with you, how do they do that? So um, I think the easiest way is just to go to my website because uh, there you can send me a message. Um, you can book a complimentary discussion, uh, discovery call, and we can actually chat about your specific issue. And so my website is A-N-I-T-A-W-A-N-G-M-D.com. And then just connect with me there. As always, fascinating and informative conversation, and I really, really appreciate you doing this. Oh. Uh, thank you for having me. Thank you, Dr. Anita Wong. Love